All right, let's talk about trends of the periodic table. So first question is, what's a trend? And the answer is, a trend is a pattern. So what we want to do is look at a property of, an, of elements and notice that there's certain patterns of it on the periodic table where um, the largest amount of this property might occur in a certain corner. So let's, let's look at an example before getting further into that, though. So, okay, what can we see in a pattern when it comes to the size of an atom in terms of the number of protons. So let's look for a pattern with the number of protons. Now you should know that the number of protons determines which element it is. For example, one proton makes it a hydrogen. We got how many neutrons or electrons are there, one proton is hydrogen. Or 29 protons is copper, regardless of how many neutrons or electrons is there. So let's look at a pattern for this. You know, you'll notice as you go across a period from 19 to 20 to 21 to 22 to 23, whatever, the number of protons increases as you go this direction. So I put that arrow there to show in which direction the pattern is increasing, because for this period and this period as well, as you go this way, the number of protons is increasing. Um, likewise, across a group, which is the vertical grouping, um, you go from 2 to 10 to 18 to 36, etc. So in other words, it's increasing as you go down. So that's why I put this arrow here. So for all of these groups, it increases, the number of protons increases as you go down. For all of these groups, it increases as you go this way. So what these are saying is, as you go downward and toward the right, which is to say, this part of the periodic table, ignore this. So this part of the periodic table is the furthest down and the furthest right. This would have the greatest number of protons because this is where the pattern is at its greatest. And then opposite of that, opposite corner here would be the pattern where it's least. In this case, the pattern is number of protons, so it's the least number of protons. So that's what you can do with patterns. It allows you to, if you didn't know this atom existed, or say you wanted to create a new element down here, you can make a prediction that it would have a, a greater number of protons because the trend is going as it increases to go this way and this way. So if you had something here, you predict it has more protons, whereas if you had some random element you didn't know about here, you predict it's less. Um, or if you were to add something out in the corner out this way or whatever. Now, this is a simple thing because the number of protons is something that should be familiar from early in the course, but let's look at some other things, though I suppose first it might be a good idea to practice this. Okay, let's practice this, right? So which of them has more protons, copper, zinc? So you know, let's practice taking this pattern and using it. So if remember I said earlier, this pattern increases as you go down and toward the right. So the closer it is to this corner, the more protons it is, and the further from this corner, the less protons. So let's look at copper and zinc and decide which one's closer to this corner where the pattern is at its most. So there's copper and there's zinc. And the question is, can you tell, is copper or zinc closest to that corner? And when I look at that, I say, well, clearly zinc is the closer of the two to this corner. So that's why I have zinc as more protons. In this case, they're both the same um, distance from the top, so it's further right. And basically, it's closer to the corner where the pattern is at its most. Uh, let's do the same thing. Let's compare copper and silver. So if you compare a copper atom and a silver atom, we once again need to ask which one's closest to this corner. Now, they are in the same group, uh, but they're in different periods. And this one's in a period that's closer to the corner. It's further down. It's basically just closer. There's really not much else to say it. So um, because of that, and they are the same distance in this direction, but this one is a little closer down here. So yeah, silver would have more protons. If you didn't have the number of protons on here and you had to just guess based on its location, that's what you would do. All right, so that's how you use that. Let's look at some other things now. Atomic radius. So imagine what you learn in geometry, the radius of a circle. That is the same radius we're going to use for this example here. The atomic radius really tells you the size of an atom. So no two atoms are the same size because they each have a different number of protons and a different number of electrons, and those protons and electrons interact with each other. And because, like it says, the electron cloud is most of the size of an atom, those interactions between protons and electrons determine how close the electrons stay to the core, or aka the nucleus of the atom, and that in turn determines how much space the electron cloud takes up. 
So two competing factors determine size. Remember, electrons are negative. So they, um, let's see, ah, here we go. Yes, they are negative, they will repel each other. And because they repel each other, they will push each other further apart. So the fact that they share the same negative charge makes the electron cloud want to expand as the electrons push away from each other. But that said, what it's saying here, protons pull the electrons inwards. So the protons pull the electrons toward the center. So you have these competing forces of the same charge of negative charge of the electrons making the electrons want to move away, whereas the protons are pulling them inward. And so the balance of how those two forces play it out is going to be determined by how many electrons are there pushing each other apart and how many protons are there pulling the electrons in. And that's why, because each atom has different numbers of protons and different numbers of electrons, those different combinations result in different sizes. So to look at this, the largest size is in this corner. Now why is that? It's because these have um, a large number of protons, yes, but they also have a large number of electrons. So because of that, the way it works out, um, there is something called an electron energy level. And so the electrons only occupy that energy level until you get beyond a certain number and then it grows quite quickly. So that's why there's a big change from here to here, for example. So as you go across this way, there's more protons and there are more electrons, but they're still in the same energy level, which is why they get smaller and smaller, because those protons are pulling the electrons in more and more. And then when you jump down to the next row here, uh, what you get is jumping up to the next energy level, and then all of a sudden it gets big again, and then more protons pulls it in and pulls it in and pulls it in. The important idea is, here's the trend. The largest atoms are in this corner, because they have a large number of electrons. Um, the smallest atoms would be the opposite. Can you tell which corner that is? It's uh, not here, not here, it's up in this direction. That's where the smallest atoms would be. Now, uh, as we look into this, what you gotta do is then think about how we're gonna ask you a question about this. Well, you should be able to take this pattern without having this, if we just give you this right here, though this visual helps, but this should be enough information to take two elements and decide, hmm, which one's likely to be bigger if you don't have any further information? Which one could you make a prediction about? So let's do this one. Suppose we didn't tell you how big a sodium atom is. We didn't tell you how big a chromium atom it is. You could use this pattern to figure out which one is physically larger with a larger atomic radius. So uh, here's sodium right here, and there's chromium right there. Now you could get a ruler out and try to whatever and see which one's bigger, but that, uh, 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 we want to just follow the pattern. How can we use this pattern for which one's bigger? And the answer is, you got to remember uh, which corner has the trend at its maximum, aka the biggest electrons, or sorry, the biggest electron cloud. And then be like, okay, since it's this corner, which one's closer? And my answer would be that the sodium is closer to this corner than the chromium is. Therefore, I would say the sodium is going to be the larger of the two, aka larger atomic radius. And that's why the answer is what it is. Another trend, first ionization energy. The amount of energy needed to remove the outermost electron. So first ionization energy would be, for example, the amount of energy when you take sodium metal and then let it react with something. When it does, it will become sodium ion by releasing an electron. And that's how you show the electron was released. So the ionization energy, the first ionization energy, the amount that the first electron absorbs or releases upon separating from the atom in order to leave a cation behind, and then that electron will go react with something, bond with something, join something, whatever. So. One of the things that um, should be clear when looking at ionization energy is that low ionization energy means easy to move an electron. Sodium is a great example of low ionization energy because highly reactive, this is why sodium explodes on contact with water. It's because that energy makes it very favorable for the electron to separate. And when that electron separates, it goes attacks and breaks apart water molecules, releasing things like hydrogen, which can then explode. And it does so very, very quickly because the energy is so favorable for this to happen.
So low ionization energy means this happens super easily. Whereas high ionization energy would be, for example, let's look at a non-metal like, say, oxygen. Oxygen wants to be an oxygen with a 2 minus. It'd really rather gain two electrons. It's not alive. It doesn't have a brain. But it's as if it wants to gain two electrons. And so instead of that, if you try to, instead of adding electrons, if you try to subtract electrons to make an oxygen with a positive ion or the positive one charge, it's really unfavorable. It's as if it really doesn't want to do this. It, this is the last thing it wants to do. It wants to gain electrons, not lose them. So it's very high energy. It's very energetically unfavorable. It's unlikely to happen without something really forcing it to happen. So that's why um, high, ionization, high ionization energy, different to move an electron, that's why it tends to be nonmetals, which are the things that tend to become anions. So, to add to that, let's mention that atoms of small atomic radius tend to have greater forces holding the electrons to the protons. Okay, in other words, small atomic radius means the electrons are closer, electrons are negative, protons are positive, so the closer they are, the more they pull each other in, which means it's harder to separate them. So, just to show that visually, these ones have the electrons closer to the protons, and therefore the protons hold on to them more. That's why in this corner they tend to not want to lose electrons. Whereas in this corner, the electrons are further away from the protons in the center, and therefore they are more easily released. All right, so let's go back to this. So, in that result, first ionization increases, first ionization energy increases as you move upward and toward the right. So that shows right here as you move upward and toward the right. So notice this corner of the pair table over like fluorine, that kind of thing. Now, um, usually we don't really include the noble gases because they don't really react with stuff or gain or lose electrons. So, but you get the idea. It's over in this corner of the periodic table. So let's give you a choice between nitrogen and iodine. Which one would be the greater first ionization energy? Well, knowing that it's greatest in this corner, you gotta ask yourself which one's closer to this corner. So uh, since it's not labeled there, nitrogen is this one. And then iodine is the fourth one down. So one, two, three, four. So there's nitrogen and iodine. You guys ask which one's closer. Well, this one is three squares away from the edge. One, two, three, four squares away from like the edge up here. So um, because of that, I would say, hmm, which one's closer? Nitrogen's closer. And because nitrogen's closer, I would say that nitrogen has this property in greater amounts, which means nitrogen has greater first ionization energy. So that's the reason why I said nitrogen is the answer. It's because it's closer to that corner of the periodic table where the trend is at its maximum. All right, now, uh, let's add another one to the list, electronegativity, another trend. So I want you guys to know that electronegativity is the tendency of an atom to attract electrons toward itself. So electronegativity, the more electronegative it is, the more it does not want to lose electrons. So that's why I use this little graph to get the idea. It's how much it attracts electrons toward itself. So atoms with high ionization energies tend to be highly electronegative. And for that reason, we actually have another case where the trend increases as you go rightward and toward the top of the periodic table. So uh, that means that things that would have a um, a high ionization energy will also tend to have very high electronegativity, and things with a low ionization energy over in this corner will also tend to have a very low electronegativity. So let's practice with that one. All right, practice question. Which element has greater electronegativity, iodine or sulfur? So you look at the, so you consider the chart. Uh, again, it's greatest up in this corner. So we look at sulfur, which is over here and we look at iodine, which is way down here, and you have to ask yourself, all right, which one's gonna have this property in greater amounts, AKA more electronegativity? And since sulfur is closer to the corner where it's at its greatest, I'm going to say sulfur is the more electronegative of the two. All right, so that's it.